Hi there, this is Callan Bentley. Welcome to your first pre-lab video. This week in lab we're going to be taking a look at minerals and specifically how we tell minerals apart using their different properties. We're going to take a look today at stuff and um, think about the stuff that surrounds us on a daily basis. So if you look around your home or your lab, wherever you're watching this video, um, you'll notice that you're surrounded by various materials. If you look in the background behind me, you can see I'm surrounded by wood, which obviously comes from trees. That's not a mineral. But depending on your location, you may have some glass in your immediate field of view. That glass does come from a mineral. It comes from quartz. Uh, you may be surrounded by drywall. Drywall is a um, building material that's made out of another mineral called gypsum. Um, you're going to be able to tell different minerals apart by the end of today's lab. And this may sound like a big complicated task, but in fact it's going to use some pretty simple um, materials, some pretty simple tools. You're going to be looking at minerals in the context of whether they can be scratched by a nail or whether they can scratch glass. Um, a penny will be one of the tools you use today, even your own fingernails. We'll also be using a magnet. Um, and then you'll be using all those different tools in the context of the mineral identification key in your lab manual. That will allow you to figure out which mineral is which, and therefore what human uses that mineral is good for. Let's take a look. Remember the relationship between minerals and rocks. This is an example of the rock known as granite, and you can see that there are different colored patches to this granite. Those different colored bits are minerals. For instance, the gray colored bit right there is quartz, the black colored bit right there is hornblende, and that pink stuff that's so prominent, that's feldspar. So we're going to be focused on the minerals today so that in later labs we can learn how to use the minerals to identify rocks. Which of the four items on the screen are examples of minerals, and which of the four are examples of rocks? Take a second to consider this. Well, hopefully you noticed that this one right here and this one right here have a distinct crystalline form. Obviously, the actual crystals look very different. One is transparent, one is metallic, one is sort of prism-shaped, and one is cube-shaped. But those are examples of minerals. The other examples, like this thing here and this thing here, those are examples of rocks. And you can see that many different individual crystals that make up those rock specimens. So we are not focused on those today mineral specimens is their color. And this is useful, but I don't want you to depend too much on it. For example, all the minerals you see here in front of you are varieties of quartz. There is a milky kind of quartz, there's a smoky quartz, uh, a sort of orange colored quartz, and a purple colored quartz, but they're all quartz. So the color alone isn't going to be sufficient to identify the minerals. Here are examples of the mineral fluorite. You can see that there are a bunch of different colors. One thing you'll notice that they all have in common, though, is they have a similar shape. So that shape is something that is more important. It's referred to as mineral habit. And so some examples of mineral habits are illustrated here on the screen. You can see there's a large variety of different habits, from a cubic sort of shape, like you see down here in the lower right, to a spray of sort of needle-like mineral crystals. And then you can even have a mineral form that is fibrous, and we call that asbestos. Another characteristic of minerals is how they reflect light. Some examples of that are shown here on the screen. One of the most obvious differences in the way that minerals reflect light are some minerals reflect it in a metallic fashion. So in this uh, image here, we've got galena and native copper. Both of them look like metals. Obviously, one has more of a coppery tone and one more of a silvery tone, but they both reflect light in a metallic way. Other minerals have a uh, more earthy luster, so they kind of look like dirt. Um, others have glassy lusters or opalescent lusters, satiny or waxy lusters. And a lot of those are a little bit more subtle than the metallic, non-metallic difference. One thing that you'll really be able to rely on this week in lab is your assessment of mineral hardness. Minerals are classified in terms of their relative hardness on a 10-point scale that runs from the softest mineral known, talc, up to the hardest mineral known, diamond. You're going to evaluate the hardness of minerals, their resistance to being scratched, using substances of known hardness. So one of those is going to be your fingernails. So hopefully you brought your fingernails to class today. You will also be using a copper penny, wire nails, 
a uh, harder piece of metal like a, a knife blade or a masonry nail. And then there's a streak plate as well. Some labs will also use glass. Glass is about the same hardness as the knife blade, about five and a half on the Mohs scale. So how's this work? Well, basically go and try and scratch the mineral. Start with either the hardest or the softest and then work your way towards the other end of the scale and eventually you'll get stuck somewhere in the middle. So for instance, say you had a mineral that was so hard it could scratch your fingernail and it could scratch a copper penny, but it was not hard enough to scratch a wire nail. So the wire nail would be harder than the mineral. That would mean that the mineral's hardness falls between a four and a half and a three and a half on the Mohs scale of hardness. One example mineral that falls into that range is the mineral fluorite. So here's an example uh, where we've got two minerals and we've tried to figure out which one is harder. Um, basically all you have to do is grind them against one another and whichever one succeeds in scratching its neighbor is the harder of the two. So in this case, sample B would be harder because it scratched sample A. Another technique that you'll be using this week in lab is streak. You're going to have a little square piece of porcelain which is called a streak plate. That's this thing right here. And what you're going to do is rub your mineral specimen against that streak plate. It will leave behind a powdered form of the mineral, and the color of that powdered form of the mineral is diagnostic for figuring out which mineral it is. So in this case, you've got a mineral with a distinctive golden metallic luster, but it leaves behind a blackish streak on the streak plate. What's curious here is that the streak color is actually far more reliable than the color of the mineral specimen itself. One mineral that's particularly tricky, but it can be teased out with the benefit of the streak plate, is hematite. You can see here that hematite comes in both a non-metallic and a metallic form, but they both leave behind a brick red streak on the streak plate, so you can rely on that. Another characteristic of minerals is how they break. Some minerals break with an irregular fracture. Other minerals break with a so-called conchoidal fracture. Irregular fracture is just like what it sounds like. It's irregular. Conchoidal fracture is pretty distinctive because it's sort of a, a scoop-shaped fracture, often with little ribs that run along it. Its overall shape is something like a clamshell. Other minerals have weaknesses within their crystal lattice that allow them to break more easily in some directions than in other directions. This is referred to as cleavage. Up here in the upper left we have an example of mica. Mica is a mineral that has one plane of cleavage and it breaks very cleanly in that one direction and that one direction only. Other minerals have two planes of cleavage like this one right here and this one right here. In the example in the middle, the two planes of cleavage intersect at a 90 degree angle. So that uh, angle right there is 90 degrees. Whereas over in this example here, you can see the angle is far wider than 90 degrees. So that's a non 90 degree angle intersection between those two planes of weakness. Other minerals have three planes of cleavage that can intersect at 90 degrees, or three planes of cleavage that don't intersect at 90 degrees, or even four planes of cleavage. All of those are possibilities. Here's another example. This is sort of a distinctive thing that you'll find on a very few minerals. It's called striations. On certain planes of cleavage of plagioclase feldspar, you'll see these little tiny lines that run across the surface of the cleavage plane, but you'll be able to see them if you tilt the mineral back and forth in the light. Another example of a distinctive property that doesn't apply to most minerals but does to a few is the property of being magnetic. Magnetite is a nice example of a mineral that has the property of being magnetic. Another property that's very distinctive and will cue you in instantly as to which mineral you're dealing with is the reaction to acid. You will have in lab some dilute hydrochloric acid, and if you put a drop of that on the mineral calcite, it will immediately start fizzing in a fairly vigorous fashion. So bubbles will be produced and it will be giving off carbon dioxide gas. Let's see a demonstration now from a couple of students. What we have here is calcite and halite, and what we're going to do today is tell the difference between the two. Halite tastes salty, so we're going to try and see which one it is. This is obviously calcite, doesn't taste salty. This is halite, tastes salty. The other way we can tell is by putting a drop of acid on them. The halite will not fizz, the calcite will. And this one is fizzing. Let's take a look at an example mineral here and pretend we're keying it out just like we would if we were in lab. The first thing we need to do is we need to take a look at its luster. And this has a non-metallic luster. So we can go in our lab manual to the uh, flow chart that basically says non-metallic minerals and it's relatively light in color. The next thing we would do is test its hardness. All right, And in this case, this mineral is going to be pretty darn hard. It's going to be harder than glass. 
So if you scrape it against the little glass plate that you have in lab, it's going to scratch that glass plate. Next off, um, we can take a look at its color, which is sort of a, a peach color here. It is going to be too hard to streak, so um, it's not going to leave a streak on the streak plate. It's actually harder than the streak plate. And then we would zoom in on its breakage pattern. And in this case, it's got two planes of cleavage. So there's one plane of cleavage on the top of this mineral specimen, and then there's another one on the front. Notice that the top plane is also repeated on the bottom of the mineral specimen, and the front plane is also repeated on the back of the mineral specimen. And on this third surface, like over here, you have an irregular fracture. So two planes of cleavage, we would want to take a look at the angle between those two planes, and in this case that angle is about 90 degrees. So that is going to really help us zoom in on which mineral this is. It's got to be one of the two feldspars. So if we want to distinguish between potassium feldspar and plagioclase feldspar, we want to look for the presence of striations. We don't see any striations here, so it must be potassium feldspar. Another example comes to us from the metallic uh, group of minerals. We uh, note that it has a metallic luster, and then we move on to assessing its hardness. It is softer than glass, so it can't scratch glass, but it's harder than a fingernail. If you drag it across the back of your manicure, you're going to scratch your fingernail, but your fingernail will not be able to scratch it. If you take a look at the streak, it's going to leave behind a gray-black streak, and you will notice that it's got three very well-defined planes of cleavage. So one making up the left and right sides of the specimen, one making up the top and bottom, and one making up the front and back. As you tilt this back and forth in the light, those will be very obvious to the eye. The other thing that you'll notice about this mineral that's very distinctive is it is quite dense. Um, that's because it's lead sulfide, and the presence of lead in the crystal structure makes it a very heavy mineral indeed. All those things add up to mean that this mineral is galena. So it's as simple as that. Basically, start with the classification key on the left side, look at the most basic properties such as its luster, and then zoom in to progressively finer and finer levels of detail to figure out which mineral it is. Once you've figured out which mineral it is, you can assess its economic importance, and you'll have a better sense of where we get our stuff. Thanks a lot for your attention. This has been a pre-lab video.